Hey, Happy New Year's, everyone. Now, when we think Happy New Year, we usually think, let's party. But now that it's January, I'm thinking about dry January. Dry January, you might ask? What the heck is that? Well, it is a movement that started in London um, probably 10 or 15 years ago, and it's growing in popularity, and it's really about taking the month of January off from alcohol. Now, that might sound like a really great idea to you, and it is. It also may be intimidating and make you think, how am I gonna cope with the pandemic and the politics and work if I'm stuck at home for a whole month and I can't have a cocktail or one of my favorite glasses of wine? So what I wanna do today is share with you three of my favorite mocktails something to help entertain your tongue and your taste buds during this month when I suggest you take a break from alcohol. Um, I'm Dr. Sally Lamont, a naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist in Marin County, California, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge, where I have a practice. And beyond that, I love food and live on my website, drsallyskitchen.com. That's D-R, Sally's Kitchen which I've made to share recipes and vital health info with you. And um, I, I want to uh, today share um, this information with you because, you know, I love alcohol as much as you guys do. It's really relaxing to come home, especially if you're a cook and you've worked all day and you want to prep a lovely meal and you want to sip on something delicious. But there is so much growing research that the daily intake of anything more than one to two drinks that contain alcohol really takes its toll on our blood sugar metabolism, on our liver function. You know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is growing like crazy because of such a, a sugar addiction we have in this country. And then alcohol just really does a number on the liver. It's very difficult to detoxify especially with every passing decade. So what you can drink in your 20s and 30s is not what you can drink in your 50s and 60s and beyond. So uh, we also know alcohol has a, a negative effect on the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, obviously the kidneys. It's tough on the gut lining. So there's lots of good reasons to trade things out for this month and try some mocktails. Now, it's easy to go to the grocery store today and find probably dozens of brands of sparkling water or flat waters that have been flavored with a hint of anything from watermelon to pomegranate to blood orange. So you can always go that route, but I thought it would be fun to tell you about some different things that I think um, tickle the taste buds in a more interesting way and potentially have some health benefits. And one of them, I don't know if you've ever heard of shrubs. Uh, the word shrub actually comes from the, I got a note here, it is the Arabic word sharbash, which means to drink. And so this is a very old cocktail, if you will, or mocktail, where it's, you know what it is, is that it's a drinking vinegar. And um, you, know, you can start with good old fashioned uh, brags, apple cider vinegar, which is just basically apples that have been allowed to break down and start to ferment into alcohol, and then that alcohol gets transformed into acetic acid, which is what is vinegar. And there's some basic uh, research, not a lot of it, that su suggests that uh, drinking apple cider vinegar every day helps to alkalinize the system uh, uh, help both stimulate the appetite as well as keep us from overeating and um, stimulate digestive enzyme output. Um, I kind of like sometimes to just take a, a, a half of an ounce or a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and mix it with a good splash of sparkling water. And I think of it as like a bracer something to prepare you for something tough. Like when you've come home and you're just looking for something to give you a little slap in the face to get going on your evening. But I'll tell you, it's sour and not quite as drinkable.
level as I would like. And that's where we get to the subject of shrubs. So what these are are flavored vinegars, and they're much easier on the taste buds. Um, they do contain sugar. All shrubs contain sugar. But what you're using is about one part uh, drinking vinegar, flavored shrub, to a few ounces, four to six ounces of sparkling water. So I'm going to show you how to do the first one. And I like putting it in a beautiful glass because everything is better in a pretty cocktail glass. So we're going to pour a little less than an ounce, just because this is a smaller glass, of this fabulous product from Napa Valley uh, Distillery. I found this at the Oxbow Market in Sonoma. It's a fabulous farmer's market with restaurants and oyster bars and this distillery will where they sell all sorts of things that you can use to dress up your cocktails. And so we're going to mix one ounce of this. This is my favorite. It's called a cocktail shrub. This is the pomegranate, but they also make a cranberry one. And so just think that what you're getting here is sort of like a cosmopolitan. Now tell me, doesn't that look like a nice Cosmo? And I'm going to stick a, uh, a piece of rosemary in it because I think that kind of goes with the Christmassy, wintry pomegranate. And honestly, it's really delicious. The addition of the pomegranate juice and the sugar takes away that intense acetic acid and really makes it delicious. In fact, it's so delicious that just since the first of the year, I have managed to drink several ounces of this. But I want to send you over to Napa Valley Distillery where you can pick up your own shrubs. But I will bet you in your local area, you'll be able to find um, different uh, distilleries that are doing the same thing. And it comes in so many different flavors. I'm going to have to have another sip. It's so delicious. Now, the next thing that I want to tell you about are bitters. And it may seem like that's another kind of crazy thing to drink. Vinegar, bitters. Well, we have bitter taste receptors at the back of our tongue. They're part of the 501 of the five flavors. But it is a flavor we don't get a lot of in America. We're so obsessed with sweet and salty less so with sour and umami and bitter, we really only get with coffee, maybe dark chocolate, and, um, and maybe with alcohol. So, in fact, though, bitters have been used for millennia to support and stimulate digestion. And probably, um, I was gonna stop with this, but I think I'll start <laughs> with this one, which is from Wise Woman Herbals. It is a bittersweet elixir. This is really a tincture. It's an herb tincture. So it does, it began its fermentation, not fermentation, but let's say um, distillation process with some alcohol. So what this is, and it's called bittersweet elixir, it's a combination of taraxicum, which is dandelion, gentian, fennel, ginger, turmeric. These are all digestives. They have been used historically really in um, countries around the world, cultures around the world, to uh, improve digestive health. Again, research is thin on all this stuff. These are old remedies. But um, new research is suggesting that when we use bitters, it actually stimulates our vagus nerve to function properly. And that's going to result in better digestion because the vagus nerve is that 10th cranial nerve that travels the length of our body all the way to the large intestine and rectum. So it's a big, long and powerful nerve. And if we want to have really good digestion, stimulating the bitter receptors is a good idea. Dandelion is really helpful for our liver and for detoxification. Fennel has always been used for um, helping with heartburn and what's called dyspepsia, you know, bloating, gas, and cramping. And so this is a delicious actual herb tincture of bitters that um, I use medicinally. 
There's also a formula that I'm thinking of from Germany called Iberogast, I-B-E-R-O-G-A-S-T, and it's like real medicinal bitters, and it's actually intended for, um, for indigestion, for SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So if you have any problem with you know, indigestion, I would suggest you experiment this month with instead of drinking a glass of wine or something else, try some bitters. Now, the, the kind of first generation commercial bitters for cocktails um, is a Venezuelan product called Angostura Bitters, and um, it has a good flavor. It's not just for old fashions, Manhattans, that's what goes into it. This is an essential component for uh, an old fashioned a bourbon drink, but it's really good on its own. And what I want you to know about bitters is it doesn't take much. Really, uh, 15 drops is a half of a milliliter, 30 is a whole milliliter. It's less than a teaspoon, it's not a lot. This doesn't, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. that's more than 15, because uh, I found that this bottle doesn't really regulate the flow very well. But I have put a slice of blood orange in the bottom because I'm all about the garnishes. It makes everything pretty and things taste better when they're pretty. And so that was just 15 drops of these Angostura bitters. And so I'm going to taste it and tell you what I, I'm picking up here. It's honestly really delicious. There's definitely ginger and gentian. Uh, gentian is one of the most bitter herbs, long history of medicinal use, but they're complex. I, this has a little citrus in it, which is why I wanted to mix it with um, a, a garnish. Of, I don't know if you can see the pretty blood orange slice in there, but this is really quite delicious. And it looks like a cocktail, kind of tastes like a cocktail, and it's something to sip on while you're cooking and socializing. Not that we get to do a whole lot of that. Maybe while you're on a Zoom call. Cheers. Mmm. So that's, oh, and one other. I pulled one other bitter that I've been having fun with. You're going to find bitters brewed just like shrubs. And the next thing we're going to talk about, kombucha, locally. So if you're in any kind of a city that's maybe larger than 100, 200,000, you're going to find some local brewery that's decided to play around with uh, kombucha or shrubs or bitters. And this is Scrappy's Bitters, and this is a cardamom flavor. I love the spiced cardamom. It's kind of a cross between um, ginger and cinnamon. It's used in chai, which, by the way, I'm going to demonstrate how to make my chai next week. So you can make your own chai, and it doesn't have to be filled with all that syrup from you know where. Um, <laughs> uh, but all, almost all coffee shops today have them. Um, uh, so backing up, bitters. This is a cardamom flavored bitter. Um, but again, they come in all flavors. So experiment with bitters. And you know, the way you use bitters is uh, uh, 10 minutes before you eat a meal. That is traditionally when it's done. To help promote the production of saliva, help stimulate gastrin, a hormone that tells the stomach to make more stomach acid, helps the liver make more bile, stored in the gallbladder and secreted when we eat fat, helps the pancreas secrete digestive enzymes. So there's some really good reasons. Oh, one more, it brings blood flow to the intestines. And all of that really does translate into improved digestion. So that's the scoop on bitters. And I think I'm gonna take one more sip and then I'm gonna tell you about kombucha. Mm. Really delightful. So then there is kombucha. Now, 20 years ago, nobody knew about it. Um, because I'm a naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist, I actually had a pet, uh, we, uh, it's called a SCOBY, <laughs> that is used to ferment sweetened black tea, though you can use green tea, and you make your own kombucha. Now this isn't about making your own shrubs or bitters or kombucha. 
I'm just going to sh uh, share with you one from a company locally called Marin Kombucha. And they have this, they have a lemon ginger that's delicious. I happen to like this apple juniper, but they have a pinot sage. They're all small batch uh, fermented in oak barrels. So what this SCOBY thing is, is it's really, it's gross. It's, it's a slime mold. And SCOBY stands for a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And so, you know, when uh, you make it on your own, you just get a big gallon jar and make some black tea and put some sugar in it because you have, you know, yeast ferments, excuse me, yeah, yeast ferments sugar into alcohol. But in this case, it doesn't end up as alcohol, or if it does, it's extremely low. I think it, it doesn't. What it ends up with as a tangy beverage. So this SCOBY grows, you have to have a starter, kind of like the mother in apple cider vinegar. If you've ever bought a bottle of Bragg's um, apple cider vinegar, it's got that kind of dark, uh, stringy stuff, and that's a complex of proteins and enzymes that, uh, and microbes, uh, yeasts, that actually uh, ferment the sugar of apples into apple cider vinegar. Here, this SCOBY functions like the mother to ferment that sugar into this tangy drink. And of course, now, uh, most grocery stores sell an array. Most cities have, um, again, small breweries where they're creating their own, and they're also a delicious blend. So let's, uh, let's try this Marin Kombucha Oak Aged Apple Juniper. And most kombucha is, is, it looks kind of like this because it's a fermented tea. Kind of a, just looks like a dilute golden tea. And all of these have bubbles in them, so got the bubbles going on. And again, this is really subtle, really soft. Honestly, much less bubbly than the sparkling water I've done in my little soda stream. Um, I often will use a Pellegrino, or <clears throat> there are several other European, and then we have Calistoga water here. So um, lots of great bubble waters, or you can just carbonate your own, probably better to use mineral water if you've got it. It's gonna have extra minerals, especially Pellegrino. I have a girlfriend, an Italian girlfriend, who told me decades ago that the Italians just love Pellegrino and they consider it the key to health because of the minerals it brings. So you can mix shrubs and bitters with sparkling water to give them that little extra zest because, you know, bubbly drinks really make us think of things being festive and more delicious. So um, here's some kombucha. And this, again, is it's just really light, really pleasant. Um, just a little bit of an apple, not an apple cider flavor, much lighter with a little juniper undertones. So these are all wonderful, tasty alternatives to wine. I'm going to talk about alcohol just a little bit because in my practice, <laughs> virtually, well, a lot of women in Marin, nestled between San Francisco and Napa County, a lot of women drink wine. And menopausal women, perimenopausal women is who I see, and so many women come in in these perimenopausal, menopausal years with night sweats. There is something about the resins, tannins, glycosides that get generated through the fermentation process of grapes that just seems to aggravate night sweats in women. So if you're looking for a break from your nightly glass of wine as you're ramping down from the day, I hope you'll think about these things because they're easier on the liver. They definitely aren't gonna create night sweats and hot flashes. And though this may sound kind of crazy coming from a naturopathic doctor, I hear it echoed through the integrative and functional medicine space most all of us have had the experience that if we drink a clear spirit like vodka or gin or white uh, blanco tequila 
they're just a lot easier on the body than the more yellow caramelized distilled spirits like gold tequila or um, bourbon or whiskey or scotch. Um, so I think it a small quantity of that mixed with a little fresh fruit juice and bubble water is a really great alternative to just grinding away on those bottles of wine every night, which is so easy to do during isolation and during the pandemic. You know, alcohol rates have soared, uh, sales have soared during the pandemic. So I'm using January as an opportunity to just build some new habits, some extra discipline, so I can go into the rest of the year and enjoy partying without overdoing it. Um, I want to invite you to go to drsallyskitchen.com and subscribe so you can read my uh, blogs. I just put one out today on the subject of dry January and the Whole30, one of my favorite ways to start the New Year's, and uh, a little overview of intermittent fasting. We're going to go deeper in that at a course I'm teaching at the end of this month, the Healthy Immune Reset. You know, there is so much we can do to improve our health so that our immune systems are strong, especially our innate immune system, that part that is in us from basically birth with the white blood cells and an army of uh, macrophages and lymphocytes and uh, uh, neutrophils that fight infection. And the way we eat and live, though, promotes inflammation higher blood sugar, higher blood pressure, high cholesterol, weight gain, overweight, obesity, these all come together to make us more susceptible to any viral illness and certainly COVID. So the Healthy Immune Reset, we're going to take a deep dive into um, what you can do to strengthen and support and optimize your immune system. And I'll be discussing the science behind the supplements that look like they're most helpful, the herbs, and it's going to be food first. I've got a, a great breakfast, lunch, and dinner recipes, my soup uh, cookbook. I've got a breakfast, uh, not cookbook, but a recipe uh, guide, let's say. And um, I'm going to do a segment. I'm going to have some special guests come in and talk about um, naturopathic therapies to help support and strengthen your respiratory system and keep your immune system peaked. We'll talk about essential oils. So it's gonna be a really fun class, just five weeks running from the end of January to the end of February. Uh, you can check that out at thehealthyimmunereset.com. So I hope you've gotten something out of this little meeting today here in the kitchen. And uh, I'm going to say cheers to a better year. May 2021 uh, bring you great health and happiness and prosperity. Cheers. <laughs>